Welcome to 13 of the most painful smartphone fails ever. Starting off pretty bad, but ending up in some absolute nightmares. Number 13 is the new Motorola Razr, a phone that everyone wanted to love. I give it nine out of 10 for the idea, a phone that manages to be both a throwback and a glimpse of the future at the same time. It's just that it's been delivered with four out of 10 execution. There is an initial high when you flip open this folding screen for the first time. It's beautiful. It's enough to make a grown man cry, but that's about where the fun ends. Because to achieve this, almost every single feature that actually has a use is compromised. The battery sucks, the camera sucks, and even the display has had an alarming amount of reported issues. That said, I don't think it's completely fair to bash new ideas just because the implementation isn't great. And that's the reason the raise the reason the razor, the reason the phone is not further down on the list. It's the fact that it kind of succeeded in its intention of just being cool. And once again, people are paying attention to Motorola. So overall, I'm only giving this a two out of 10 fail rating. Number 12 is on the subject of foldable phones, the very first one. You might've heard of a company called Royal. They were founded with the sole purpose of creating flexible displays. It became very clear though that displays is probably what they should stick to. See, when they were founded in 2020, 12, no other company was even close to building a foldable smartphone of their own. So Royal probably thought, easy, we got this. If we can be the first company to build a foldable smartphone, well. But what I think happened is they became complacent. Before we knew what was happening, it was 2019 and Samsung was about to launch an actually good foldable phone. At which point it looks like Royal panicked and just released whatever their latest prototype was as the Royal FlexPi. They knew that if they weren't first, then they really didn't have anything. It's a similar form factor to the Huawei Mate XS I took a look at a few weeks ago, except it's the thickness of a book when folded up. And the software is so bug ridden. It was bringing up visions of times that that uh, I thought we'd move past. The FlexPi was just a really bad start to foldable smartphones. It was bad enough that it made people take a step back and question why on earth companies were trying to fold their phones in half in the first place. So this one's getting a three out of 10 failed from me. Also, a shout out to Surfshark VPN for being the sponsor of this video. Number 11 is AirPower. Not a smartphone, but a smartphone related bit of tech. Well, it ended up being a bit of a no-show. Back in 2017, alongside the iPhone 10, Apple showed the world wireless charging done right a pad that you can place your devices anywhere on and they'll just start charging. And this was massive because whilst Apple is never really the first to enter new product categories, generally when they do, they tend to set a new industry standard. Not this time. The next two years were a constant swirl of rumors and teasers. Air power was mentioned explicitly in iOS updates as a supported feature and quite literally on the physical packaging of the second generation AirPods. But come 2019, Apple canceled it. RIP Air Power. See, with normal wireless charging, the back of your phone has one coil and the charger has another coil and placing these two coils together creates an electromagnetic field that delivers power to your phone. But the only way that Apple's idea was possible, the idea of having an entire pad that could deliver charge, not just one specific spot on it that you had to line your phone up with, is by packing many wireless charging coils into a tight space. And in the end, the company couldn't find a way of doing this without either the electromagnetic fields interfering with each other or just generating too much heat. So not the kind of fail that's gonna cripple a company like Apple, but at the same time, it will mean that future announcements are just treated with a little bit of extra doubt. Three out of 10 for this one. Now, in the last couple of years, we've seen quite a lot of smartphone companies that we previously loved just kind of fade away, disappear into almost non-existence. And for each one of them, there's usually been one or two mistake devices, phones that have been so bad that they've kind of set them on the path to ultimately failing. For example, HTC in 2020 is dead as a dodo. They've fallen from an 11% market share in 2011 to less than 0.1% now. And there are a whole number of factors, but one phone that really sealed their fate was the HTC U Ultra. See, there was a time when I was actually excited about HTC phones. You might remember the HTC One. It had a beautiful metal unibody with a gorgeous display, and the company collabed with Beats to make its boom sound speakers. It even had a software skin that people didn't hate, which was more than you could say for a lot of phones at the time. This phone could have been a turning point for the company had they continued the innovation, but they followed up with a couple of mediocre phones and then one just bad one. And with the insane pace of the smartphone market, you just can't afford to do this. The big selling point of the U Ultra was a secondary ticker display that 
nobody asked for. The battery sucked, and instead of building on their great Beats audio technology, they removed it alongside the headphone jack, which at this time was still a pretty sensitive topic. So, considering where HTC once was, and where they are now, the U Ultra is getting a 4 out of 10 fail. Number 9 is LG and their G5. See, there was a point when LG was soaring in the smartphone market. Their G3 was one of the first phones in the world with a quad HD display, and it was a genuinely competent alternative alternative to buying a Samsung or an iPhone. Unfortunately, life's not always good. The G4 that came after shipped with what could only be described as a cursed software. Tens of thousands of G4s would just randomly start shutting down, they'd restart, and they'd even get stuck in continuous boot loops. People were mad at LG, but thankfully, the G5 was coming, the company's one shot at redemption, at reminding their fans why they loved LG in the first place. So they announced a phone that you can stick a grip onto. The LG G5's big selling point was the fact that you can attach modules, things like a camera grip that adds some extra battery. But considering that LG is not exactly gonna sell tens of millions of G5s, an ecosystem of modules built just for this one phone is destined to fail. Nobody's gonna want to make these modules because instead of just building a universal gadget that could appeal to billions of smartphone users across the world, you'd be building a gadget that at its absolute maximum could appeal to let's say the 3 million people who actually bought a G5 specifically. So, just like with HTC, it only took a few not so great phones for LG to kind of lose its place in people's hearts. So again, the G5 gets a four out of 10 from me. Number eight is BlackBerry. Ah, oh, gosh, oh, BlackBerry. Of all these smartphone companies that have gone from riches to rags, BlackBerry's fall is definitely the most dramatic. It's hard to believe, but we're talking a company that used to have a 50% market share in the US, 50%. And they've gone from that to a quite literal zero. BlackBerry is gone, and their Z10 smartphone pretty much embodies the entire reason they failed. BlackBerry never understood why people wanted a smartphone. To be clear, they were insanely successful before the smartphone era, and it feels like this made them complacent. When people got their first taste of iOS and Android, and they started wanting a proper app ecosystem, BlackBerry completely misjudged it. They thought, oh, maybe it's touchscreens that people want. So they made a touchscreen version of their existing phone phone, which by the way was one of the worst smartphones in existence. When this didn't work, BlackBerry could have, and probably should have, just dropped everything and tried to build the best possible Android phone. But they missed the mark again. They thought, ah, we know what it is. What people really want is a proper smartphone operating system. We'll get them this time. So they built the BlackBerry Z10 running on their new in-house BlackBerry 10 OS. And to its credit, it finally felt like a smartphone. But again, they failed to realize the importance of apps. BlackBerry thought that because security used to be one of their big selling points, they should focus on that again, which meant that they couldn't make this OS as open source and as developer friendly as they needed to. Again, a fatal mistake. So, to reiterate, I don't think the Z10 is the worst phone BlackBerry has ever made. They've had some real shockers in their time. But just like with HTC and LG, the bigger failings are often not the one-off mistakes you make. It's quite easy to recover from a mistake. The real problems come when you start heading down the entirely wrong path. And the Z10 was exactly that for BlackBerry. 5 out of 10. This was messy. Number 7 is Samsung's Bixby Virtual Assistant. It's become a bit of a joke in the tech community. See, the thing is, for most Android users who wanted a virtual assistant, Google Assistant did pretty much everything they needed to anyway. And so when Samsung launched Bixby, because it didn't really have one killer feature that was instantly going to make people jump over en masse, their only option was to force people to use it. Samsung's phones would start coming preloaded with Bixby as their default virtual assistant, and they had a dedicated button to summon it, like some sort of genie that could just about tell the weather. It didn't help that Bixby at launch was both slower than Google Assistant, and it struggled massively with accents. It's almost a shame, because Bixby's gotten loads better since launch. We're at a stage where there's two camps of people, those that have never heard of Bixby, and so don't really care, and those who know all about it, but having seen it through its rocky start, basically think it's a meme at this point. Knowing Samsung though, they won't stop pushing Bixby as much as I want them to. So I'm giving this one a five out of 10. Number six is the Amazon Fire Phone. And it was a monumental miscalculation. See, the way Amazon's business model works is they sell ultra cheap hardware, like the Kindle, like the Echo. But the reason they still make money from them is because these devices become a portal for people to then buy other stuff from Amazon. For example, by getting a Kindle into as many people's hands as possible, Amazon can sell more eBooks from their 
the Amazon bookstore. Anyways, the Fire Phone operated with a similar concept, but it was so much worse. For starters, it was little more than a glorified portal to the Amazon App Store, but the company also tried to push a feature called Firefly, which allowed you to take photos of things in the real world, and oh so generously gave you a link to buy them from, you guessed it, Amazon.com. They even had the audacity to remove the Google Play Store, all but ensuring that every digital purchase made on this phone goes directly to Amazon. And the icing on this cake was that, unlike their other hardware products, which somewhat make up for this by being cheap, the Fire Phone wasn't, priced right alongside Apple's iPhone. It didn't help that the Fire Phone's coolest trick was a set of four cameras that enabled something called dynamic perspective, which was a bit pointless at the best of times and vomit-inducing at the worst. So the Fire Phone was comically bad. It was both the beginning and the end of the company's mobile efforts, and Amazon took a $170 million L just trying to make it. The only reason it isn't further down on the list is because Amazon as a company had enough going for them in other areas that they could just sort of pretend this didn't happen. Still though, they're quite deserving of a prestigious 6 out of 10 fail. Number 5 is Essential, a company that hit the ground flying in the smartphone market. But in four short years, they went from crushing it to crashing in it. See, Essential was started by Andy Rubin, referred to as the founder of Android, and he made a whole load of claims about what Essential was going to do. It worked. Before even making a single product, Essential had hundreds of millions of dollars in investment, and the company was valued at over $1 billion. Again, without making a single product. With that in mind then, you probably saw where this was going. Yeah, they screwed it up. But not just once. The first up was a smartphone, and it wasn't terrible. Visually, I'd say it was one of the most futuristic phones on the market. It's just that there was a huge gap between the kinds of claims that were made and what the phone actually delivered. After that didn't work out, Essential did a weird one. They bought the company behind a dead email client. There were rumors that the company was working on an AI-powered smartphone, so they were gonna use the technology from this email client to give the phone the ability to auto-reply to emails. And that all adds up, we just never actually saw this phone. Anyways, at this stage, Andy Rubin was then exposed for being involved in a scandal, which I won't go into in this video. But in what seemed like a bit of a last-ditch attempt to get people back on his side, he released images of Project Gem, a completely new kind of smartphone that I'll admit looks fascinating. However, it looked like Rubin's reputation was beyond repair at this point. So a couple of months later, Essential announced they were shutting down. Essential, essentially, failed. Sorry, I've been waiting all video to say that one. But yeah, I'm giving this a 7 out of 10 fail. Now, you might have seen something recently about Apple slowing down older iPhones. This is bad, but at the same time, there are two sides to this coin. On one hand, you can see why they might have done it. The amount of charge that a battery can hold, it naturally falls over time. So Apple's reasoning was, if we slow down older iPhones, then we can help people's battery to still last a full day. On top of that, some older iPhones were shutting down unexpectedly because of excess strain on the battery. So throttling the performance actually fixed this issue. And to be honest, I can believe their reasoning. This is the kind of thing that Apple would do. This is a company that is famous for doing everything they can to make the user experience simple. They're the kind of company that will take options away, that will themselves decide what is best for their users, as opposed to letting them decide for themselves. And this is an example of that. On the other hand, regardless of whether the intention was innocent or not, Apple should have just been more open about it. By hiding what they were doing, it almost made it seem malicious, as if Apple was slowing down older iPhones to keep people upgrading to the latest. Either way, it's come back to bite them. Apple has got to pay up to $500 million back to customers, not to mention just the damage in the trust of the Apple brand. So 7 out of 10 again for this one. Okay, top 3. And in third place is Red Hydrogen. Where do I even start? Well, I guess, first of all, no disrespect to the company Red. They make cameras that, well, actually, I've had pretty poor experiences with them, but some people swear by them. Shout out to Marquez. Although, fun fact, that video him and I filmed together was shot on his Red camera. <laughs> It goes back so far. And we actually filmed it twice because this $80,000 machine, it crashed partway through. Anyways, I digress. The point is that RED makes high-end cinema-grade cameras. So when they announced that they're making a smartphone, the hype was crazy. You've got the fact that this was being made by a company that really understood cameras, that they promised attachable modules, and that the top-end version was $1,600. Of course, the RED Hydrogen 1 was going to set a new industry standard. Except... 
it sucked. Apart from being delayed not once but twice, the cameras that the phone eventually shipped with had literally nothing in common with what RED was actually famous for making. It's not just that they weren't better than the cameras on other top-end flagships, it's that they were actually very much worse. And the modules we were promised, well, they just never arrived. And so, after failing so incredibly hard on the first Red Hydrogen, the company decided that second time is the charm. And I'll spare you the details, but it wasn't. 7 out of 10 for the Red Hydrogen series of phones. Or lack of. Right, now number two is a little bit controversial, but I think it's justified. Google Pixel 4. Google. Not red, not essential, Google. And so when a company of this scale makes moves, there's a bigger expectation and just more to lose if things go wrong. And wrong things did go. The Pixel 4 was not just a fail, it was three fails rolled into one. First of all, the leaks. The Pixel 4 was leaked so dramatically, so far ahead of its launch, that Google decided to just sort of go with it and confirm the leaks. Now, I can see how this strategy might work, revealing the way your phone looks, but then telling people to wait to see what it can do, and then dropping a link to a live stream happening in a couple of days' time. That makes sense. But the way Google did it, they revealed the Pixel 4 literally four months before it actually launched. That's enough time that by the time people were actually holding the phone for the first time, it already felt like old news. And that brings us on to the second thing. One of the big hype factors is that the Pixel 4 was when Google would debut their new Soli radar technology. And in the lead up to Soli, they showed us all kinds of hyper futuristic applications, like your phone being able to detect minute hand movements performed even from a distance. But the reality was much less cool. It barely extended beyond just swiping over your screen to scroll through songs. The third fail was the hardware itself. There were just so many unfortunate decisions made here, from the phone just shipping with 64 gigs of storage, to Google cancelling their previous scheme where Pixel owners could get unlimited storage of photos and videos, the fact that the battery wasn't great, or the fact that they skipped the ultra-wide camera in favour of the much less popular zoom camera. So yeah, the Pixel 4, not a runaway success. It was three fairly substantial fails thrown together to make a pretty bad launch. Now, just before number one, a couple of things. A, if you're enjoying this video, a sub to the channel would be incredible. And B, I have actually made another video on 10 more of the biggest fails. So if your favorite fail isn't on here, it might be on there. Okay, number one is, it's bordering on comical. I don't remember the last time I saw a phone that misjudged the smartphone market this badly. Welcome to the Energizer P18K. On paper, it was the dream. People love phones, people love big batteries. So why not just fuse them together to create a smartphone that can last literally 50 days on a single charge? It turns out there is a reason. There are things that have never been done before because no one's thought of the idea or because they're at the very cutting edge of technology. Yeah, well, this isn't one of those cases. The P18K, in its pursuit to be different, has really just become difficult. We're talking a smartphone that weighs three times the amount of a normal mobile, one that's so thick you'll probably need to carry around a bag just to keep it with you. So okay fine, it's not the kind of phone I'd buy, but it's an interesting experiment. Can we just leave it at that? Then it got worse. See, Energizer then set up an Indiegogo campaign to raise a million dollars for the mass production of the phone. And just to give you some perspective on how badly this went, Samsung sold about 16 million Galaxy S10s in their first quarter. Nokia sold about 5 million phones in the same time period. And even Sony sold about 900 thousand. Energizer sold 16. So yeah, I'm gonna give this one an 8 out of 10 fail rating. But something that isn't a fail is Surfshark VPN. It is literally the most affordable VPN service out there. You pay $1.99 a month, and that gives you unlimited simultaneous connections. You probably already know that VPNs can keep your browsing secure, especially on public connections, and they also help you to get around internet censorship in certain regions. But Surfshark does a lot more than that, as well as being able to connect to single locations. It allows you to multi-hop or encrypt your data through two different servers at the same time. Surfshark also monitors your email account for suspicious activity, it checks your passwords, and it even lets you use something called Blind Search, which is an internet search tool with no logs, no tracking, and no ads. The two of the coolest features here are a built-in ad blocker, which saves mobile data and helps you load pages faster, and the ability to access 15 different Netflix libraries from around the world. So check the link in the description and use code BOSS to get an 83% discount and an extra month for free. Thanks a lot for watching and I will catch you in the next one.